you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Yeah. Mm. Now I'm telling you, but he said, you say, heavenly God, thank you. Thank you, Lord. 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 Thank you, Jesus. So prior, and that the prognosis is that she needs to have, must have surgery. And she decided to give her case over to the, the great physician and to do some things with her diet and follow the instructions that she believed that the Lord was leading her. He's done wonderful things for our house. Hallelujah. And even for yours truly. So with a few hours remaining in this year, if I had my wish would say, as I shared with our congregation here, I would love nothing better than to start preaching now and preach all the way up to the 12 o'clock hour. That will not occur, but, and it may not be feasible, but as my son used to say, when he played basketball, that today would be a good day to just leave it all on the floor mm -hmm. and to leave it here. So, beloved, if you have your Bibles, would you join me in Second Peter? And this is our foundational text for this <coughs> work here. Second Peter chapter 3. And I thank you for lifting up spiritual song. And chapter 3 and verse 18. Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 18. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Beloved, join me. You may be seated. Join me in praying over today's message. Day watch. 2023, the year-end review, and our subject, or the thrust of this message, is the glory of God in the church by Christ Jesus. Our Father and strong God, we thank you for another opportunity to come before you. And these precious souls 
and a number dear than those who have joined us and shall at the appointed time. As we take in the view as 2023, anthropomorphically speaking, gathering up all of its things to give way to a new year, where there'll be opportunities again for you to be faithful and exceeding God, generous and kind and gracious and merciful long-suffering for you to be who you are and for your son to be revealed in your church so as we consider the year in a capsule and ask some probing questions and consider what you have set before us since January 1. We ask that you be glorified in this. Your people, Lord, would be blessed. Sinners would be saved. That you would receive all the glory in your church by Christ Jesus. We ask this in his name. Amen. Amen. And only now a matter of a few hours, 2023 will be engraved in history. All of our calendars will become obsolete, except for a reference guide as to events that took place. But we will say on the other side of 12 a.m. last year. And considering what to say today, how should the church view the exodus of a year where one year was giving way to another? I believe that it will require us to do a year in review. And that year in review should consist of a biblical evaluation of the ministry of the word that has gone forth from this sacred desk and from down front and on the airwaves. And there should be two areas in which we magnify and that is one biblical excellence, which is a place where we cannot afford to be wrong because of souls. And two, biblical effectiveness, a place where we can never become complacent and lax. And then biblical growth, a place where fruit of changed lives can be observed and inspected. Fruit that will remain before God and beyond his scrutiny. The first area is evangelism, the outreach of this, I call it a great word, evangelism, outreach 2023. And I want to set before you three probing questions. Two had something to do directly with this ministry in the last, maybe not so much. And can you answer these within your heart? But you don't have to audibly say anything. How many souls were saved 
as a result of this ministry from January the 1st up until December 31st. Down to that you are aware of. How many believer baptisms followed suit? You know the answer to that question. But maybe a little further out of the orbit of this work here within these four walls, How many people as a result of the ministry of Jesus Christ in your life have been saved and they also that is family, friends and they receive water baptism believers baptism that we've had and in third and this might be an indicator as to the times in which we're living. That the apostasy has been running like a, a tide, but it's, it's running faster. Beyond your ministry and scope, how many people do you know and have heard of have been saved? You know the answer to all of those questions like I do when it comes to myself. The next would be the a biblical evaluation of the ministry of the church and to the church. And, and that's where our text comes in. And the questions I want to raise come right out of 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. Are you growing? That word growing means, it means to enlarge, it means to increase. Are you growing? Something that you and the Lord both know the answer to that. When we pick up weight physically, we may not see it first. We may feel the effects of it. Others tend to see it on us and they may make a comment. But are you becoming heavy for the Lord in the areas of grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Is this something that God could say yes he is yes she is do you sense it within this time period Growing in grace. What is grace? Grace is the divine influence of Christ upon your heart. It is it's the person of Christ and his influence that is a reflection in your life, much like the moon, which has no light in and of itself. And when the moon shines, it's as a result of the sunlight. Are you growing in grace? And then in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because not only would God know it, if that's the case, you would know it. And the reflection of that would be hard for others to miss.
in the knowledge of our Lord, who is supreme Savior. He's our deliverer, Jesus Christ. In this process, it leads to always growth in Christ. To him be glory. And for our Bible study class, you know what glory means. It's the self-revelation of God through his son, Jesus Christ, where he is worshipped and he is praised, where he is adored, he's magnified, he's exalted. It's everything about Christ. Both now, that speaks of a, a time period in association with the growth, both now and forever. I love how it said in Ephesians chapter 3, in verse 20, now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundance abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us unto him be glory where? location in the church by Christ Jesus I'm hoping that this year Reminds you, and maybe in a positive way, of last year, where the mission of this ministry was to make it all about the glory of God in the face of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Where we wouldn't settle for making it about mere men and their ministry and theology and things of that nature though they have their place that this ministry stands as we give glory to God in the church by the Lord Jesus Christ and you've heard me say this when we first arrived here in 2013, that where we had been, this ministry, would be where there would be the glory of God first, even if there were no souls saved within a period of time that we thought and felt that someone should be saved. Someone ought to come and fall at Calvary's cross so to speak, and give the life through repentance and genuine faith toward God through Jesus Christ. But even if no one comes and the gospel is preached, that God would be glorified. But also the thrust of the ministry continues to be that souls would be saved. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. And he that winneth souls is wise. Proverbs 11 and 30. Christ said this to a rather motley crew of men that would have only risen to the height of perhaps being fishermen in the occupations in which they had, tax collectors and things of that nature. He said, Follow me. When it comes to evangelism, you have to follow him. And he said, what I'll do, I will make you fishers of men. I've told this story. And I'm minded not to share it because of the content. But I had a man follow me into the ministry of Christ 
When I say ministry, he made a false profession. He saw where being associated with Christ would take you into the church where there were a lot of people and they were dressed up and there were women and there were all of these things. He followed me. Other people saw it. They didn't call him out on it. They told me that he wasn't right. He was foul. I sensed it. He had a foul spirit. But he's following me. That same young man killed his wife at his mama's house. He killed himself. Follow Christ. And I'll make you fishers of men. Four and nineteen. Well, when the persecution arose with Saul of Tarshish, he was as a wild, ravenous beast. He was a terror to the church. And therefore, they that were scattered abroad, you know what they did? They went everywhere doing what? Preaching. The word, which is synonymous with preaching the gospel. <clears throat> the souls will be saved. Now what about what about this business about souls saved and, and what about lives changed? Because that's where I believe the the great problem lies. Much of those my age and a little younger and a little older, salvation had been pronounced upon them as it was me in my home church at the age of 14. No one followed up to see what kind of life I was living. As a matter of fact, I did things after I was water baptized, as they called it, and joined the church that I hadn't done before. I had no fruit of repentance. I had no faith toward God through Jesus Christ. That's one reason why folk are not coming for. Because they said, I'm good. I'm, I'm straight with God. I did what they told me to do. I joined the church. I was water baptized. What more do you want? I don't plan to go back unless y'all have food on the property. That should be a, a changed life that goes with salvation of the soul. We have those who talk like the church but live like the devil expecting to spend eternity because everyone that dies go to heaven because he joined the church at an early age. But I want to use a fellow that we spent time with last year, maybe even this year, before we arrived at this location. You call your attention to Mark. Mark chapter 5. And this is where Christ had Cast out a legion of demons. And he was saved. And I, I think I can prove it. Not only did Christ liberate him and rescue him, he, he freed him of all of those demons. But I believe we can see a pattern of what happens when someone is genuinely saved. He had a problem with going here and there and everywhere. He was first up in the mountain, then down in the tombs. He was cutting himself. And one of the great issues that he had is he looked like he couldn't keep his clothes on. In Mark's gospel. And we'll pick it up in verse 13. Let's pick it up in verse 12. And all the devils that was in this man besought Christ, saying, Send us 
into the swine that we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave. And the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine. And the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. They were about 2,000 and were choked in the sea. And they that fed the swine fled and told it in the city and in the country. And they went out to see what it was that was done. And they come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion. And notice that this is, this is what the change has come over him. He's no longer in bondage and he's, he's saved. We're going to prove this to you. Notice, he's sitting. This is something that he couldn't do. He was here and there and everywhere. But he was sick. That speaks of self-control, temperance. In the presence of the one who had liberated him and given him what I would call eternal life because he didn't believe. And I, like once, once again, we believe we can bear it out in the scripture. Five things here. He was sitting and then he was clothed. We're living in a generation that looks like can't get enough clothing on. For those who are saved, you know now how to dress. But he's clothed. He's not a spectacle. He's clothed. He has clothed on. And the other thing is, he's in his right mind. That's what salvation does. It, it, we, we would say, like the old folk used to say, they say, uh, uh, they have a do right mind. And then if he would. And they that saw it told them how it befell to him that was possessed with the devil and also concerning the swine. And they began to pray Jesus to depart out of their coast. And when he was come into the ship, he that had possessed, had been possessed with the devils, what did he do? He's imploring Christ. He's praying that he would the devil prayed him that he might do what? Be with him. That's what salvation is. Not to hang out with the devils. Not to be under the control. And as it was said this morning, the bondage of the wicked one. He wanted to be with Jesus. Do you see? It begins with a change of course. In direction to the place where he's sitting, clothed in his right mind. And but now the, the, the folk don't want Jesus. They would rather have the hogs and the pigs and rather have the livestock and the income. But now he wants Jesus. He can't get enough of Jesus. That's what salvation is. Amen. It's about Christ. I'm so weary and I've almost given up when it comes to the world being the world. That's what the world does. False teachers, that's what they do. But what about the church being the church? So that we can discern whether a person is sitting there's been a change of course and direction in their life. They're clothed now. As they sit under the word of God. And they're in the right mind. Because now they're moving into what we call having the mind of Christ. And as he's imploring that he won't be with Christ. But this right here. There's five of these points in this. Just in this presentation right here. Look at what Christ said. How be it Jesus suffered him not. Jesus, Jesus tells someone. You can't go with me. That's what he says. But Jesus suffered not, but said to them, you go home to your friends and tell them how great things the Lord have done for thee and have had compassion on thee. That's the evangelism portion. You want to know why most folk aren't evangelizing? Because they didn't want to be with Jesus. And they're not in the right mind. 
and the reason they're not, not in the right mind because they don't, they're not clothed in his righteousness. And, and they're not seated in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Souls are perishing. And the church, we are concerned with other things, events and things that are happening. Look what he did. And this is what, you can draw the parallel. What did he do? Oh, Lord, if I can't go with you, I don't know if I can go home. They don't want to see me. I ran around naked. I cut myself. I was first one place than the other. What did he do? He departed. He did what Jesus, Jesus said, go. That's what it means to be a Christian. You go where the Lord sends you. And he began to do what? Publish. Daddy used to go out with his old bag. With his seed. I used to see him, man. With his mustard seed and collard. And he would have his bag and he would call. He, he would say, boy, I'm getting ready to go ahead and broadcast these seeds. After he got the ground all prepared, he'd go out and just string it all. Man, your, your grandfather used to do it, man. Mr. Matthew Pollard, he used to do that. He would say, and throw those seeds everywhere. Well, that was good ground. He published what, what great things the Lord had done for him. The Lord had found him, glory to God, because the Son of God has come to seek and to save that which was lost. He liberated him, glory to God. He set him free. Tell how great things Jesus had done for him and all did marvel. And what was the greatest thing that he did for him? He saved his old ashes, soul. Just like he saved yours. And he saved mine. And he gave us beauty for ashes. Soul saved and lives changed. And now we come to the expansion of the church. Acts. Chapter two. That's what, that's what I, now this is a true salvation. The church expands. Acts chapter two and verse forty. Peter's preaching his inaugural message on the day of Pentecost in verse forty, and with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, "Save yourselves from this untoward generation." And they that gladly received his word were baptized. That's believer's baptism. If you're here today and you receive unbeliever's baptism, if you're not saved, you receive unbeliever's baptism. You basing your salvation on you just getting in the water. The first baptism is a spiritual baptism. Once repentance has occurred in the mind, the spirit of God baptizes us. Into the body of Jesus Christ, with regeneration is in view. And then the Spirit of God indwelling the believer. And then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day <clears throat> there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly. Notice, once they were born into the kingdom of God, what happens next? They have to go to church school. You don't join the church as folk have alleged. You may join a fellowship, but it takes Christ to add you, such as those who are being saved. In the same way that a, a, a newborn infant will suck the jaws in, because they want, they want the sincere milk of the mama's breast. And they'll settle for infamil. They'll settle for Similac. But they want what mama has. And that's the way it was with them. And notice what happened. And they continued steadfastly. Church school wasn't arduous. Go get there in a hurry. Can't be late. Don't get in my way. The apostles' doctrine 
in the overflow of that and fellowship and the breaking of bread and prayer. And fear came upon every soul. Many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common. Sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple. Do you see the cohesiveness that the word of God does? First is the doctrine. Then there's the fellowship. Then there's the breaking of bread. Then there's the prayer. Then they continue to stay together. They, 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 they were as the disciples were with Christ. That's what the early church looked like. They were just they're mobilized by the spirit every day. Where are you going? I'm not working. I'm going to the temple. Where do you think I'm going? I'm going to be fed the word of God. Can't wait until Pastor Trey, he gets off and he's going to come by and he's going to break the bread of life. He's going to feed Jesus to us. He's going to give us, feed Christ to us, that Christ will teach us the word of God. Breaking the bread from house to house. They eat their meat with gladness and singing of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And notice what happened in verse 47. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. I believe there's a reason why folk aren't being saved. But let's not let that reason be because those of us who handle the word of God have sin in our life. Where God really can't use an unclean vessel. Man, I've identified some idols in my life, and I've given, I've given a lot of them to the boot, but, but the Lord's still dealing with me with some things, y'all. I want him to be able to use me and use me up. I want I really want to. I, I, I told y'all, I didn't start well, and it hasn't gone well, and I have to finish well. Some of you, you may have said, but I don't understand him. He's different. He's, he's you know, he, I don't know how to, you know, I don't know. I feel the same way about me. I know I'm a strange one. But know this, I love you. I love your soul. I love the life that God has given you that you're saved. And I love you even if you're not so that you can become saved into the family of God. You have the expansion of the church is in view. But not only do you have the expansion of the church, we have the establishment of biblical covenant marriages and the family. Yeah. And this is what Adam said when the Lord brought the woman to him. Adam said, This now is bone of my bones. Do you see how he's making a claim on what the aspect that was his in this process? The bone, the rib. This is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, this call shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and they be one flesh. Do, do, do you see how the adjustment that gets made from being a sinner, a child of the devil, children of wrath, wickedness, repugnant, to Becoming a saint and a believer and a child of God, considered to be sons of, and daughters of God, we go back to a place now where biblical families can be established as it was before sin. Which I call marriage the second institution because the first institution is work. And that's where man learned to work with the Lord and for the Lord, in the presence of the Lord. They learned how to follow instructions. 
and do what the Lord told him to do in his place of work. That was his ministry. The garden was his place of ministry. Then as for the children, that was Genesis 2, 23 and 24. But also that in this holy matrimony now, that they can bring up their children in the training, the education, and admonition of the Lord. And that word admonition means to put on their mind that you have to do what you're being taught or else you will be corrected. It's bringing them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Do you see how everything cycles, peri? That's the Greek word, peri, around Christ. It's all about the risen, ascended Savior, full of glory. Even for the children. And then finally, the reconciliation of biblical covenant marriage. Turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And then you can find 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And those who follow this ministry, you've been, some of you online, you've been following my wife and I for years. I have yet to cease from what I believe the Lord called me to do. And that was the biblical restoration within the church. Is restoring the local church, what a, a true church that is, to the scriptures. And the pulpit or the word, what we call the ministry of the word, to honor. That when, that when we come behind this desk, it's to be honorable in the sight of God as he sent forth prophets and as the apostles were sent by Christ. It's to be honorable. And that the assembly would be an assembly of respect. Where so much so that the world even respects the assembly, not for foolishness and buffoonery and clownship and all that stuff. And for also having the church in biblical order, where leadership in the church from the pulpit to the yard is male. For as a man indeed ought not cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. Paul said, I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man. She's to be in subjection. Why? Because Adam was first formed. And then Eve. And Adam was not deceived. But Eve was. Now, here in 1 Corinthians, when it comes to reconciliation, this is a hard subject for folk, but the grand scheme of things is that the reason why we're in Christ is because of divine reconciliation. Do you understand what reconciliation means? It means to become friendly again with God. Don't you know that there was a time that God knew you before there was sin upon your account? He knew us before we were in our mama's womb. He knew Adam before he created him. And he knew all of us and he had all of us accounted for in eternity past. So there was a time when he knew us apart from sin. Now, the problem that we have when it comes to marriage is that the world says you can cut them off like you cut off fingernails and like you get a haircut and you can let them go. The only problem with that is that marriage is God's institution and he's the one who has given us a government to go by and it is the word of God. And Christ has spoken to us. We need therefore no one else opinion. First Corinthians chapter 7 
and verse 10, and verse 10 through 12 cannot be broken by whatever the Apostle Paul says after this. Because he doesn't have what? Two standards. God doesn't have double standards. Now, so, I'll leave that alone. And unto the married, this is the Apostle Paul, and unto the married I command. Now, Paul, in his apostolic authority, has the authority to say what Christ has said to the church. I command, yet not I, but the Lord. I mean, it's the same Jesus as when we were just celebrating a little while ago. Let not the wife depart from her husband. Is she supposed to stay through abuse? No. You, you know, you know we, don't, we, don't, we don't mess with that foolishness like that. She pack her stuff and she goes. She don't stay around for abuse and threat. And the same thing with her husband. Because that can work two ways. You gonna stay there telling the Lord, say, I can't leave. He didn't tell you you couldn't leave. You fix him get knocked out, you gonna stay? Let her, let the Lord deal with her. And leaving means you go, doesn't mean you go to someone else. Let not the wife depart from her husband, but, and if she depart, but and if she depart, let her remain unmarried. Now, turn back if you would to Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. What happens if she departs, but she decides that she wants somebody else? What happens? Or oh, man, same difference. Romans chapter 7, and beginning at verse number 1. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over man as long as he liveth. For the woman which have a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he what? <clears throat> but if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. So then if, on the condition, this is conditional, while her husband liveth, she be married or maybe not married. She's having a, an affair. She's out just committing adultery. That's the thought here. She be married to another man. She shall be called an adulteress. We don't call folk that in the church adulteress. But that's what the Spirit said. She shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Now, let's go back over to 1 Corinthians. And verse 11. But if she depart, let her remain unmarried. Well, we know what happens if she marries someone else or she has an you know, affair. Or... Be what? Reconciled to her husband. And let not the husband put away his wife. This is the will of God. That if you, you say, well, I want the Lord to speak to me. I want the Lord to tell me what I'm supposed to do. Advice I need to give to a friend or to a cousin or to a relative. Whatever the case may be, this is his admonition. Second Corinthians. Chapter number 5 and verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who have reconciled us to himself by who? Jesus Christ. And have given to us the ministry of reconciliation. This is for salvation. But marriage is something that we can bring alongside. And this, this is a great principle here because reconciliation is reconciliation. Because God created man in his own image and after his likeness. And have given to us the ministry of reconciliation to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing the trespasses unto them and have committed unto us the word of reconciliation. 
The first thing that most who call themselves Christians say, dump her. Trade her in for a new model. Kick her to the curb. Let her go. Turn her loose. It's a violation of the will of God. And that's one of the reasons why some of the things have come upon us is because we've given out that kind of counsel in the church. And we've confused folk when it comes to the word of God. And especially those who are looking for a way out. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. And though God didn't beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ. Stay, be ye reconciled to God. Now, that's the, that's the message to the world. Be reconciled to God. Peter said, save yourself from this untoward generation. So why would it be any difference when it comes to the one flesh union that if things hit a rough spot, and the road, or they run into choppy water, that it would not be the same because God created man in his own image and after his likeness. For he had made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. The year in review, our day watch, assessing what has transpired within this local New Testament church. I don't know about what's happening in Harvest Baptist Church and the Lighthouse Baptist Church and Antioch Baptist Church and, and New Bridge Baptist Church. I don't know what's going on on there, but I do have a, I think I know what the pulse is here. We have a lot to say grace over between now and midnight. Maybe tonight we ought to leave the, let, let God watch tonight and maybe we get on bended knees and lay out some things before him, germane to some of the things that have been covered in here and some things where the Lord has revealed to your heart while you've been sitting here and you've been watching and for those of you who have been listening and especially for those of you who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ. You want to tell me you're going to let another year come by you not give your life to Christ? You see, one of the things that I noticed in some of the messages, they didn't even ask the question, are you saved? The Spirit of God convicted those who are not saved that they aren't saved and that they needed to be saved. If you're going to go back into that situation that you came out of this morning and the one you've been in all week long and that's how you've been living your life. Listen, you jeopardize and you are playing Russian roulette with your soul. You may not get an opportunity to repent and believe on Jesus Christ. You said, I've got time. You don't have time. God is the one who has time. God is using time to bring about his will, not for you to bring about your agenda. Give your life to Christ. You should run into Jesus Christ and boil him over. Run through him and say, Lord, save me. Save me. Save me. Don't let me die in Paris. Don't let me end up in Hades. Don't let me burn and burn and burn and then burn some. Don't let me end up in the lake of fire where there's weeping and the gnashing of teeth forever. Don't let me end up with my daddy, the devil, right now since I have yet to repent. Because everyone is going to end up with your father. You're going to end up with your spiritual father. Play church as much as you want to. Play with him. If you play with him long enough, you're going to find out he real. And he warned you. And he told you, you're just a church member. You don't know him. You followed him into the church. You followed her into the church. You don't know me. You don't know my ways. When you hear me speak, you despise my chastening. Repent. Repent. And church, we need to repent. Dennis needs to repent of sin and things that only God knows. And maybe someone close enough to me might know. Need to repent. Kick the idols out of your life. Get rid of them. Tear them down. Give them up. Let them go. So that the Lord can use you. He can be glorified through you. He can send you to Decapolis. Your Decapolis. Not the man in the Mark 5. The place where he wants you. Because that's why he needs you. And that's why some of us, we end up in the wrong place. 
And we're not effective. But he would be effective in the capitalist. Christ, you can't follow me. I don't need you. I don't, I don't need you to follow me. I'm going to deal with you up there in up the campus, and I'm going to be with you, boy. Let us pray. Our Father and strong God, Lord, I, I feel like I could just preach right on up into the last pee in the dish. But I don't owe these folk out this year, Lord. Some of them, they, they know. I know they, I know they be thinking some of them when they come out. Lord, what is it going to be today? What is he going to cover today? He's coming with witchcraft. And those who die talking about they're going to be married when they get to heaven. He's dealt with fathers who are not being taking care of the children and have left, left a child out here and there. He's dealt with everything under the sun. He hasn't left anything undone. Lord, have mercy on us as we confess our sins. But that little thing is in our mouth, behind the prison of our teeth, for the things we waged against our brothers and sisters, been biting them in the back, despising, won't forgive. And in some cases, there's nothing to be forgiven of. Having a hatred, jealousy, envy, indifference. The years winded up on our end. In our lives, a lot of us in here, Lord, we, we in the evening, in the afternoon, some in the afternoon. Most of us in the, in the evening of our lives here. We don't have no time to be wasting. Fooling around. We're going to be like your son, Jesus Christ. He finished his course. And went home to be with you. Lord, that's my prayer for these precious saints that are here. And I'm praying that whoever's on the sound of my voice is not saved, that they won't leave this property day without giving their life to Christ. And go pack up every ready, pack up everything, cash out. So I'm done. I'm finished. Kick the world to the curb. I'm done with the world. I see the hour approaching. Lord, we're bracing for 2024. I believe, Lord, you're going to be as you've been. You've been exceeding good because you're exceeding God. And you'll be generous and faithful and kind and merciful and long-suffering. But, Lord, men may not be so much. And as we see the hour approaching, Lord, help us to stay focused and not be distracted and don't lose heart. And for those you promised, Lord, that if we keep our minds stayed on you, you keep us in perfect peace. So with the duration of this day that's left, that someone just went to the hospital, they're not going to make it. And they're not going to be here on the other side of 2023 and 2024 coming here. And that somebody that's perfect in health, it seems right now, and they're not going to make it. They're not going to be around. And Lord, I don't know what's going to happen, but I do know one thing. If they leave here with the Lord Jesus Christ, that they'll be ushered into your presence. They'll be forever with you. And that's my prayer, Lord. So ask now that you bless your word as it's gone forth, and that you bless your people. And Lord, you make the offering of blessing to those that are not saved, that they might be blessed by receiving your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who came to this world to die for the sins of the world and was raised on the third day bodily and has gone back poised to come back to his church in Christ Jesus' name.